Let's keep going. We're on problem number six on page 278 in the data sufficiency sample questions. So let's see, they've drawn a little figure. They say in the figure above, lines k and m are parallel. I guess I better draw lines k and m. So let's see, they have line, that's line k, that's line m, and then they have a transversal line. And we've gone over all of this in the geometry playlist, if you might want to review it, and if this looks completely foreign to you. And so this is line k, this is line m, and they're calling this angle right here x degrees. This line here is z degrees. And then this angle here, that's a line, that's an angle. This angle here is y degrees y degrees. And the question is, in question number six, in the figure above, if lines k and m are parallel, so they're both parallel, what is the value of x? OK, in statement number one, they tell us that y is equal to 120 degrees. So if y is equal to 120, let me do that in, let me do this one in magenta. So we're, this is based on this is equal to 120. What can we figure out? Well, this y is y is supplementary to z, right? So when they, you know, they kind of you add these two angles together, they're, it's 180 degrees, right? Because you're completing kind of a a whole half arc or half circle. So z would be 60 degrees, right? Z would be 60 degrees, and then you could say that. I, you know, there's all these words that people use in geometry class, but if you have two parallel lines and a transversal, then these opposite inside angles are going to be the same. So you know that x is equal to 60 degrees. Another way you could have done it, you could have said, okay, if y is equal to 120 degrees, then this angle, then y and this angle right here are also supplementary, right? Because they complete this whole arc. So y plus this angle have to be equal to 180, so this angle would also be 60, and then you use what you learned in geometry class that you know corresponding angles on on a transversal intersecting two parallel lines that they're also equal. So you'd also get to the same conclusion that x is equal to 60. So either way, statement number one alone is enough to figure out x. Now, what did they give us for statement number two? And I'll do that in a different color. Statement number two: z is equal to 60. Well, this actually gives us the same information as that, because if we know that z is equal to 60, then we know that y is going to be equal to 120, even if I never, even if the book never told us this the first time. So z equal to 60 is the same information as y is equal to 120. And so you can make the exact same argument as you did for the first one. So actually, point number two alone is also enough to figure out that x is equal to 60. You actually didn't even have to figure it out. Now, and an important skill eventually when you're when you're taking the GMAT is to be able to just look at it and say, oh, I could figure that out, and then move on instead of actually having to figure out that x is equal to 60. But anyway, so this one is either of them alone are sufficient, so that's D. Okay, problem number seven. Problem number seven. What percentage of a group of people are women with red hair? So women, we want women with red hair percentage. Okay. So statement number one tells us of the women in the group, five percent have red hair. Five percent of women have red hair. That alone doesn't tell me what percentage of the entire group have uh, are are women with red hair because I don't know how large the whole group is. There could be uh, you know there there could be, I don't know, twenty women and there could be ten million men. Uh, so you know the percentage, or there could be 20 women and no men. So that still doesn't help me with you know what percentage of women, what percentage of the group are women with red hair. Let's see statement number two. Statement number two tells us where was that? Of the men in the group, 10% have red hair. So 10% of men have red hair. That's really useless. Have red hair. Once again, I don't know how big the group is, right? I mean, you you think about it. If I have uh, 20 women, then that tells me that there's one woman with red hair. And I don't know I have 20 women, right? But I still don't know how many men there are, right? If there are 20 women and, and one has red hair, there could be a million men, there could be no men, in which case 
Uh, this answer would turn out very different. What percentage of the group are women with red hair? So both of these combined are are fairly useless questions. And actually, let me let me draw a little Venn diagram because I think it's it's useful. So the entire group is both women and men. Let me I'll draw a Venn a, a Venn rectangle instead of a. So that's women and men. So some percentage of you know we don't know how many women there are and how many men. So this this area right here is women. Oh, this is women. That's the number of women, and this is the number of men. And this first point tells us that five percent of the women have red hair. So it just tells us that five percent of this area is red, right? Which is maybe I don't know. I'll eyeball it. It's like that. And then this says that ten percent of the men have red hair. So maybe that area looks something like that. Right, so we know the ratio of this to this box, and we know the ratio of this to this box is 10%. But we don't know the ratio of this to the entire universe because we don't know how many. Uh, we don't know what the total. We don't know the total population size is, so we'll never be able to figure it out. Anyway, so that is that is E. All right, problem number eight. Maybe maybe I missed something, but that's problem eight. If R and S are positive integers, R is what percent of S? So R, S, positive integers. And we want to know R is what percent of S? So essentially, we just want to figure out what R over S is equal to. right? This will give us some decimal, and then you multiply by 100, and you know the percentage. So if you can figure out this, you can figure out the percentage. Of what what per, R is what percentage of S? Okay, so statement number one. Statement number one. They tell us that R is equal to three fourths S. Well, let's just do a little algebraic manipulation. We're just trying to get R over S, so let's divide both sides by S. So you get R over S is equal to three over four. So there we got it. We got the answer. This is, that was a helpful data point. All we needed was that data point actually. Let's see what. The second data point gives us data point two. R divided by s. Well, they they wrote it like this. They wrote it the way you did in second grade. R divided by s is equal to seventy-five over a hundred. Well, that's just another way of just writing R over s is equal to seventy-five over a hundred, which is exactly the same thing as this. So these are actually you know equivalent statements almost. So each of them independently are enough to figure out. R over S, or what percentage R is of S. All right, problem number nine. Problem number nine. Let me draw a line here. I don't want to get too messy. Do nine in magenta. Is it true that A is greater than B? I sometimes find these uh, statements, I don't know, slightly humorous. Is it true that A is greater than B? <laughs> anyway, all right. All right, the the first statement is 2a is greater than 2b. So I don't know if you remember from algebra, but you can operate on inequalities the exact same way you can operate on uh, equalities, or I guess you call them equations. Uh, and you just have to remember that if you multiply or divide by a negative number, that you have to swap the inequality sign. Well, luckily in this case we're we are we are we could divide both sides by a positive number. So if you're doing if you're multiplying or dividing by a positive on both sides, you don't have to change the inequality. So you just divide both sides by two, and you could test that with numbers just to see why that makes sense. So you divide both sides by two, and you get a is greater than b. So that's all we needed. We just needed statement one. Now let's see what statement two does for us. Statement two tells us that a plus c is greater than b plus c. Well, once again, this is a we can subtract c from both sides of this equation or from both sides of this inequality without changing the inequality sign, right? So you subtract c from both sides, and once again, you get a is greater than b. So each of these statements independently are enough for us to figure out that it is true that a is greater than b. Let's do one more. Actually, I've run out of chalkboard space, so I might as well just wait until the next video.